Okay, so um, today we're going to have a look back over the module and just review what we've learned and go over a few things again, which you might find useful for your coursework. So let me get my mouse on the right bit of the screen. Aha, so we've covered um, web app design. So in general, so we've covered how the web worked and things like architectural design and rest architectures. We have had to think about code quality. Um, so it's important that your code is maintainable for you and reusable by you and others because um, coding is never finished. And um, we've looked at authentication. So Jack showed you how to use OAuth to avoid unnecessary user accounts because we all need another user account like we need a hole in the head. Um, we looked at WebSockets as well, which we'll cover in this lecture. We covered the basics of JavaScript and the language features of JavaScript. We introduced the idea of callbacks and promises. Um, and related to that, there's async and await, which we'll talk about a bit. Um, we had a look at JSON and we touched on classes and object oriented JavaScript, which is um, a sort of new features of the language, which are brought in to make it comparable to other fully featured languages. Um, so the JavaScript that we've learned can be sort of loosely grouped into two sets of technologies. So we've got the client side JavaScript where we talked about the DOM, events, Ajax and things like that, so local storage in the browser. And then we'd looked at the server side JavaScript, which is Node and related to that, it's package management system, NPM. So here we have, when we talked about how the web works, we showed this diagram of a typical web application. So the browser will send a request to a web server and the browser, we talked about how the browser goes through a DNS server in order to translate URLs with friendly human readable names into IP addresses. This request is then sent through HTTP to a web server, which sends some kind of response back to the browser. And if that response was a web page, then the browser will then construct the DOM, um, which is its internal um, representation of what of the HTML file you just sent, which is basically just a string, right? So it, it passes all the tags and reads it into memory. It does something similar for the CSS you sent, if you sent any, and the same for the JavaScript. What makes web applications interesting is that obviously um, browsers themselves typically just read data or play videos. They can't, they don't have very much interactivity by themselves. So you can send JavaScript back and that JavaScript is executed on the client to make it more feature rich. And that's pretty much what this course is about. Your web server could also have a database attached if you wanted, but it doesn't necessarily have to have one. So the DOM and events. So here is a simple web page sent and it's got a link to a style sheet and each one of those tags is an element. Um, note that the doc type itself isn't an element and the contents of the tags, if it's just text like in a paragraph, aren't elements. But you can see it's a tree-like structure and representation of your page. This is why last year we made a big deal about making sure that your um, HTML was valid. So in JavaScript, how can we find, a, find an element so that we can manipulate it? Um, in this example here, we could use window.ex1 because the H1 ID there is EX1, but um, this is fragile. So the best way to do it is to use um, query selector, which lets us use a CSS query to select the element we want. So there the hash indicates that we're looking for an element with the ID of EX1. And you might see the older get element by ID um, method, which was introduced in older browsers, but um, it's less maintainable to use that because obviously if you if you originally had an ID on an element and then you decided that you wanted two of them and you changed it into a class, the old way of doing it, you'd have to change all those function calls to get to, from get element ID to something else. If you use query selector, you just change your hash into a dot. Remember that if you are using IDs, not to break the cardinal rule is that IDs must be unique. So elements have properties, as you know, um, you use them in HTML and they are accessible with a dot and the name of the thing that you're looking for um, in JavaScript. And the only caveat here is the class list. So um, it's not, a, it's not um, necessary for elements to only have one class. They can have multiple classes and this is desirable because you can make things, you know, yellow and um, emphasized and centered at the same time without defining a class with all of these things. You can reuse your classes. Um, 
You can't just overwrite class list with a string. Well, you could, but then you'd remove all the other classes associated with that element. So you use the methods within class list. I encourage you to refresh yourself about doing that. That's a common mistake that we come to, that we see students make. Um, sorry, Sipity. And uh, elements have attributes, which is a, a map of the attributes of the elements. Form fields have valued and checked if it's a checkbox. Um, have a read of that, but basically anything you'd expect to be there, um, which is available, you know, within the opening tag, is uh, is available through JavaScript in a, in a similar way. They they match up nicely. Matt, yeah, um, you just said something uh, very important. Um, anything that you'd expect to be there is very likely to be there, but how do you ever get to expect something to be there? That's why we encourage you to look at the element reference on MDN, because once you look it over, you're not going to remember everything. Of course not. That's not the point. But you will get an idea of what kinds of things are there. And that shapes your expectations later. And then you expect this to be there. And voila, it's there. And you didn't even have to remember it. Yeah. So if we wanted to create an element and set some properties, um, we have a paragraph here that we've created and we just use document.createElement and in the quotes there we've written a p because that's the html tag that we want to create minus the angle brackets and um, we can set its ten text content to hello world and we can give it an id of hw if we want you can also attach event listeners to any element on a page so in this example here if we want to add and if we want um, the, to log the content of the paragraph every time somebody clicks on it, um, we can do that by using uh, window.example. If you remember, that's a shorthand way of getting to that paragraph tag. We can add an event listener of click, and we've said the word shout there. And above in the script, you'll see there's a function defined as shout, and it logs it to the console. It's important to realize that that's a callback to shout. So we're not calling shout as soon as that line is, is interpreted by the JavaScript. We've told JavaScript when a click happens, call shout, but we're not calling it yet. And that's the difference between a callback and a standard function call. And it's important to, and when you do that, you don't pass parameters. Uh, you don't pass parameters in the round brackets as you normally would. <clears throat> there are lots of built-in events. So we've got um, click, which is the most common one you'll use. So when a user clicks on something, do something. But we've got all these other ones, key down, key press, and key up, and all these ones for the mouse. So if you're making like a game or some kind of interactive application or something like Google Docs, when people are typing, you want to update the output as, as they type in. The All of the event listeners you need for an interactive application are there. So um, they're really useful. Moving on. Um, we looked at fetching data using Ajax. Now, Ajax doesn't really stand for anything anymore because um, only one of those things is probably right, and that's the JavaScript part, and even then that's not the name of the language. But essentially all it means is we retrieve um, resources from a URL without refreshing the page. So we can load part of a document when we start, and then when something is clicked, then go and load something else. And this is obviously really, really useful um, if you want to only if you want to do a login without refreshing the page, if you want to send chat messages to each other, um, you can use Ajax to do that if you want. So the way we taught you to do it is using the fetch API because it's the nicest way of doing it. It's really new, it was, it's not really new, but it's quite new and it's just a really neat way of doing it. So when we do this, um, you will see a couple of new keywords that arrived in the language. So here we've got await and async. So await means we don't know how long that fetch on example.com slash some JSON is going to take. Um, we don't want to pause the whole of the browser while we're waiting for that response to come back because it might be something very large that you've requested and it might take a couple of seconds to come back and you want everything else to stay responsive and you want to allow the browser to do something else. So we use this await keyboard or keyword and that just tells JavaScript, okay, go off and do that. And in the meantime, you can go off and do other things. And when it's finished, the code will start up again from the line starting const data. Um, if you use await in a function, you must use the async keyword before the word function when you declare, when you declare the function. At the top there, you can see there's the word async. Um, 
Remember that when we make an HTTP request, the headers come first and then comes the body. So that's why there's two lines there. And in this example, we just logged the result. So that's um, pretty powerful and it's taken a lot of the headache out of fetching data. We've, so in the previous example, we touched on JSON. Uh, if you remember, JSON is just a way of representing a JavaScript object or any, any entity really as a big long string. And um, you can see there we've got Jack, who's the tender age of 18, and these are the units he studies. And we've got an array in there, we've got properties, we've got string values, and you can have numeric values without the quotes to indicate that it is, an, it is a numeral. Um, before you can send any objects across a network, you need to change it to a string because HTTP is a serialized protocol, meaning it doesn't understand what an object is. We have to represent it in a string in order to send it. So we use stringify to do that. And then at the other end, you can pass it back into a nice object for you using json.pass. So it's all really very simple. We also touched on local storage. So browsers allow you to store small bits of data, not very large bits, but small bits of data between sessions or between page refreshes and reloads, because obviously your JavaScript variables, every time you refresh a page, they're all overwritten and you lose them again. So a way to, to get some kind of persistence client side is to store it in local storage. So it has um, four methods in its API and um, it's a simple key value uh, mapping between two strings. So you make up the key, it's something unique, and you associate a value with that key. So it could be something like username, or it could be something uh, a bit longer. So if you wanted to store an object there, you know, maybe you're storing the state of a document and you've got an object, all you have to do is change them into JSON and put them in set item and associate it with a key and they'll be able to be stored. So it's quite powerful, but it's a bit key. Crucially, it's actually quite simple to use, which, which is why it's quite popular. There's another one called session storage, um, but that it, you lose those um, bits of information when the browser terminates. So um, local storage is usually the one that you want. So we've talked about the client for a bit, and now let's talk about the server side. So it used to be in the old days that web servers were typically written in something like Perl or PHP or JSP, which is a Java or some or some other language. And the, and the JavaScript only ran in browsers. That's not the case anymore. Um, and this is a good thing because one, it's brought on the um, powerfulness of JavaScript and two, it's um, reducing the burden on developers. So, so um, instead of having to write in two languages, you're writing in one, as well as your HTML and your CSS and your SQL, you've taken one um, dependency out and you just have to learn Node, which is a fairly simple framework. So it's a framework for writing applications in JavaScript that run on their own. It's comprised of the V8 JavaScript engine and it's got nice extensible modules that you can use later. So a very simple example, if you made a file called hw.js and put cons this console.log line in it and then run node hw, it would run it in your terminal. You can use variables and um, functions just as you normally would and do arithmetic and everything that you're used to doing, you can do in node as well. There's also the REPL, which is where you run node at the command line. And what that does is it lets you type in JavaScript line by line and let you see the result of that action. So it's good for testing ideas and changing variables and seeing what happens. So you can split code into files and folders. So once you've got one big JavaScript file, it starts to get a bit cumbersome to maintain, and particularly if you've got lots of developers working on it and it's nice, it's human nature and it's good programming practice to split um, functions, to split related functions off into their own files so they can be maintained separately. So here you can either just do it through files. So we've got a func.js on the left and a main.js on the left and they can, um, in the first one there, we're exporting an add function which takes two parameters and returns their sum and then we put module.exports.add, and that's just a property of this of this um, package here. And we've bound, bound it to our add function. And in main.js, we can then use it. Um, if you want to put them in a folder, you can also um, use index.js for the main one, and then func2 there, even though the file is called index.js, because it's the um, only one in the folder, 
it's not ambiguous, you can do it that way too. You can always also make these exports much shorter by using the fat arrow notation um, that, that ES6 brought in. Um, for simple functions, you can declare them on the same line. So bear that in mind, and you can use destructuring as well um, in the fourth example there. So we can make our own little modules, and we want to, and we can build applications using them. But it would be good if lots of other people could do this because it's all very well writing code for ourselves, but it would be nice to be able to share it because it's when we think about application development, it's unlikely that you're going to be writing it all your, on your own from scratch. You've usually got libraries and, depend, and dependencies and plugins for whatever um, technology that you're using. And you need to think about on the other end, how do you specify where, where it runs, the live runtime environment, and how can you recreate it for your development if you're talking about web development and you're thinking about developing your client side app, um, you don't have any control at all for the live runtime environment, really. You know, all you've got is a, somebody with a web browser. You don't even or can't even specify the operating system. So you need to think about how you can support all of these um, different platforms and different um, devices. So you can use libraries to do this. Libraries are great because they're written usually by other, other people. They can be open source. They can be proprietary. Um, but they, they always have bugs in them because all code has bugs in it. They can get fixed and then they get patched, but then they might break compatibility with the ones that you're using. And very, very soon you can end up using an old version of one uh, library because that won't break your code, but then it depends on a newer version of another, which you also can't use. It gets it gets yourself into a, big, a bit of a mess. So there's, thankfully there's a way around this and it's called packages and Node has something called NPM to make this make your life a lot easier. So if we want to use the Node package manager, NPM, um, we first, in any uh, Node project that we've got, we say NPM in it and that creates this package.json file. There's all sorts of metadata about your project um, which is the name and contributors and the license. But um, the main thing is, is that you use it to add dependencies. So any package that you create may depend on other packages. Um, so if you've got ones for dependencies that your package needs to actually run, um, you use npm install and then the package name, and then it's added to your project and the dependencies automatically added to package.json. Um, you can also add dev dependencies for package development. So you might not want to put, and you don't want them to be installed when you're deploying the software, only when it's being developed. So if we have a look at how to build a simple HTTP server in Node, you can do it using the basic HTTP library, which is included with Node. Um, you don't need to do an NPM install for it. You've automatically got it. We can create a server, and then when we get a request, we can um, set the header of content type and text plane, and then with the response object, send hello world back. And then we can say the server should listen on 8080. But this is a really simple server and it's not much code, but it's also not particularly powerful. And it's also something which a lot of people writing web servers want to do. They want to be able to respond to HTTP requests and send responses. And if all of us had to write this in every program, it would be a lot of repetition. So Thankfully, we have Express, which takes all of that low, low, lower level stuff and bundles it into a nice library, which you can use. And that allows you to bind things to root and have much shorter code, um, which is much more readable and much more maintainable. So here um, we have bound um, a root on forward slash hello. So on this example, if you went to localhost 8080 forward slash hello in a web browser, um, if we didn't send a query string at the end of our URL, that's the thing after a question mark, it would say hello anonymous, otherwise it would say hello and then the name that you sent it. So HTTP, if you remember, is a protocol and it has many verbs and these are the methods that are sent with the request. And there are lots of them. The one that you're most familiar with is get, um, but uh, maybe post as well, um, get, retrieves data. You shouldn't be sending much data with get. You should be only be using post to send data, but there are other ones. There's delete, options, trace, and connect. So it doesn't particularly matter which, um, so you should send a, re a relevant status code back to any request. So your, you can program your um, Express app, for example, to respond to any one of these verbs. 
and then you should send a status back to say whether that was successful or not. So for example, here we've got send, sending 200 back says, okay, I can do that. Um, and then there are other codes that you can use um, to indicate some kind of error or some information for the client. So the ones which um, start with a two are usually happy ones. Um, this, this worked. You can send codes beginning with a three, which means um, they've moved, but this is not necessarily a bad thing. And then there's, um, if there's something wrong with the request that came to you, you could, from the client, if there's some problem with the client, you can send um, 400 codes back. And if there's something wrong your end with the server, maybe your database f fell over or something, you can send 500 back going, sorry, I can't do it right now. The key thing here is that you should use the correct status code to represent what's happened on your server. So there are assumptions made by each of these methods about what the result of it will be on the server. So you could write your own app, which is only ever used by you. And um, it wouldn't ma maybe matter to think, you maybe think, oh, it's only my web server, I'm never gonna use it. It's never gonna be deployed. But then maybe what you wrote is actually becoming really useful and you want to change it into an API, then other people will have certain expectations about what will happen when they send requests of cert using certain methods to your server. So they will assume a get method will be safe, meaning that um, they send a get request to your server and it's not gonna change any substantial, any data substantially on your server. And every time they send it, they'll get more or less the same result and it's not gonna affect your server. However, they wouldn't expect a delete request wouldn't affect a server because obviously you've asked it to delete a resource. So they would expect something to be deleted. They wouldn't expect something to be deleted from a GET request. That nobody is sitting there in Node when you write your express routes and enforcing these rules upon you. So it's it could be the case that you um, program some weird behavior on them, but just don't do it. It's and these are the expectations of everybody surrounding these methods. So you should make sure that you're following them. Remember that um, you should never trust data that came from a client, even if it was your own. Um, you've got to sanitize it to make sure that there was nothing malicious that came in. For example, if you have a if you have a client side app running in a browser, anybody can open up the developer tools and modify the JavaScript in any way they like, and then try and send you nonsense back either to knock your server over because they're being malicious or worse to steal your data. And that's about the worst thing that can happen is that data is stolen because that could has a real impact on people's lives. So you need to make sure that the um, file type is the file type you expect. And there are packages available in Node that can help you with doing that. Um, delete files you don't want. So if somebody sent you the wrong type of file or the file is too large, remove it immediately. Um, use an intermediate folder for upload. So it might be the case that you have a public folder of images and um, when they upload, you might be tempted to put it straight in the public folder, but maybe don't. Um, put it into a temporary folder first, check that everything seems okay with it programmatically before making it public. Um, set upload limits and monitor your available space. And above all, um, remember the client is not under your control. If something goes wrong with a web service and people are affected, it's um, unfortunately your fault. Well, by law anyway. So in computing, there's a typical acronym, which is CRUD, which is what we do to records of when we're managing data. And here we've got create, read, update, and delete. Um, this is an example, say for something which is emulating Twitter. So a user can post, can create stories and they can tag their stories with things. So for example, here, if we go to, if our client sends some uh, get request to stories, you'll, they'll get all the stories back. But if they send a post request to stories, a new one will be created. If they send a post request to stories and give it an ID in the uh, URL, that means it's an update and get would be to retrieve that particular story. And then in this case, we could bind to a put. When they send a put request, we can replace a story. And then obviously they can be deleted. The key thing here to notice is that this um, is mapping the HTTP verbs to the entities. So um, there are no verbs in the URL. So you shouldn't see the word get stories because we can send a get request to stories, but you can also send a post request to stories. It makes it more maintainable and it's better designed. So remember that. So finally, um, we looked at WebSockets.
So Ajax is great, but the problem with it is it's dependent on the client asking the server for data. And that's probably about 90% of what people want to do on the web. They're browsing resources, websites on, on the whole are repositories of information. And they're also, and if, the, if that information has to be updated, they're waiting for a, push, a post request from a client. However, if you think about the modern web where there's games or you've got people sending messages to each other in real time, you don't want, and you, you want the server to be able to push these updates out to the client without the client sitting there and polling it constantly waiting for an update of the state. Ajax can't actually do server push without ugly hacks. And worse, it's slow because sending HTTP requests every time has a header, it has a body, and you know it's set, there's all this overheads with the header files that you're sending. So every time you send some inf a small piece of information, it might be that the header that you're sending is actually bigger. This doesn't help with connection latency as well. So that means that if you're trying to get a responsive environment or maybe your latency, your, your the thing you're programming is latency uh, sensitive, um, that it's not a very good idea. But these can be solved by using web sockets. Um, these uh, are sort of similar to network sockets on a wire, you know, the old way that we used to do things. They're not implemented quite that way, but you can think of them as working that way. Um, they're bi-directional, which means that the client can push information to the server and the server can push information back to all connected clients or just one. Um, it's full duplex, so that's they can do it at the same time. It's low latency and it has much less overheads because you're not sending all the um, bloat that comes around HTTP. So if you want to, this is how you would um, create a socket on a browser. Um, you could just create a new web socket at a URL and we can send strings over it. And then there are events associated with um, a web socket. So you've got error, open message and close. Similarly for the server, um, Node has a WebSocket server built in. And yeah, that's how you do it. So that concludes our review today. Is there any questions? Um, I don't see any questions either on Slack or in the chat. Um, we might stop recording now and we will see if all right we have a question is it a good idea to make personal errors to make custom errors subclass the error class um yes possibly <laughs> so the the pro of that the positive is that you can catch uh and distinguish different types of errors um the negative of that is that you are introducing multiple classes and um, it may be overdoing it but how do we know we are overdoing something we have to first overdo it and then we feel the pain of that and we learn so absolutely if you have not done this before and you find a use for it please make uh, personal types of errors so subclass the error class and um, and see how that works and pay attention to the maintainability of the code and the benefits and drawbacks of doing that so yeah good idea we have another person typing henry Sorry, did you want to um, add something? No, I was going to just say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what Henry asks. Uh, how are we going to deploy our apps onto our VMs? I remember this being mentioned as difficult earlier due to Express. Now, I don't know what you mean by uh, difficult. When you have your... Uh, application you upload the sources to your vm you do or you have that in github very likely so you clone it onto your vm from github then in there you do npm install and you should be able to do npm setup npm start and it should work express has absolutely no problem running on the vm it works perfectly there um, the VMs have Postgres and MySQL databases on them. 
So if you want one, you can use that. Um, SQLite database works everywhere, so you can always use that. Uh, so yeah, it should not be a problem. <coughs> Upload the sources, do npm install, it should work. Uh, no, uh, so the, quest the, the concern was about sudo writes and uh, yes, that is uh, an understandable concerns. Often when we have machines, let me do that too. Often when we have machines, we do want to uh, be able to administer them. We want sudo writes, but the VMs that we give you are set up so that um, you don't have to install any more software with sudo writes. You should be able to do absolutely everything you need to for web programming without sudo rights if you do want to do just ask us and uh, we can give it to you that's not a problem at all mm -hmm. alvi asks about port numbers your server should start on port 8080 on the vm port 8080 is mapped to port 80 so when you connect to your vm on port 80 the vm actually talks to your software on port 8080 To go back to Henry's question as well, um, the evidence that it's easy to do, if you go back to your first year in um, assuming you did WebF1, if you used HTTP server, like typed HTTP server when you were creating your first web page, that's basically a Node.js server that's starting and running for you right there. And that is actually running on port 8080 and being forwarded to port 80 in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. Two questions all wrapped into one answer. So you're welcome, Alvi. Um, how is the authorization function going to be tested? Right. So if you if we start your app and it asks us to log in with Google, we can press the button and you should whitelist localhost so that it works for us and uh, we will just log in and um, that should work. If you use some kind of uh, your own authorization with username and password, make sure in your readme to tell us what the username and password are to test, but it's usually a bad idea in prototypes like this to try to store passwords because you can very easily get into bad habits and false sense of security. Um, does that answer your question, 887818? If only you had a microphone, 887818, it would be so easy. There is a setting in Slack to change it to change your display name to your first name, which makes talking to you a little bit less uh, strange. Um, it does, but um, I have to say, I respect if somebody wants to only be known on these channels under their student oh, ID, oh, because in, in a way it can um, keep their anonymity and um, we don't want people to have it easy to find out which student ID is uh, who. Um, right, yeah, no worries about your mic. Uh, working through this works as long as people can type quickly. So, uh, right, I have it in the database linked to an email. Uh, that sounds like it could work. If you're using Google Auth, that gives you email, so that should work. If you use your own something, then um, uh, if, if it seems to work, it should work. Uh, right, do we have any further questions? I don't see anybody else typing. Shall we stop the recording now? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be yeah. around on Slack um, on and off until mm -hmm. your coursework uh, goes in, so we should be able to help.